many of you were with us last night when we talked about the general theme of confession. And a discussion of confession automatically leads you to discussing the fact that we do sin and that sin is a problem in our lives and that something has to be done in order to take care of the fact that our sin separates us from God. So we talked about that with the emphasis on the fact that all of us need to come to the reality of our need. We need to recognize that we do sin and not do what is so commonly done in the world today and that is excuse ourselves by whatever devices we can come up with. Well, I do better than this fellow does, or these people are worse than I am, or this is really not. You don't understand why I did that. You see, all those problems came, and we can find all kinds of excuses to justify ourselves. But I just used a word that is extremely important. I want to talk to you tonight about that word, justify. It's good to see every one of you. We appreciate your coming. Some of you are visitors with us, and I know that I joined the congregation here in saying we're pleased that you've come, and you're an encouragement to us, and we hope that we can be an encouragement to you. Open your Bibles with me tonight to Romans, the third chapter. And we're going to be starting there and then backing up and coming back through again to discuss a topic that I think is extremely important. Jesus said of himself, I came to seek and save that which is lost. Several words are used in the New Testament that are involved in that process of bringing a man back to God. One of them, Jesus just used there, saved. The Bible talks about people being saved from their sins. When you use the word saved, it automatically in, in, uh, involves being lost. You can't save something that's not already lost. There are other words. The Bible talks about our being redeemed. But the word redeemed really has the concept of buying something back that has been pawned to Satan, really. And there's a certain, the term forgiveness. And forgiveness again involves an obvious point of guilt. If you seek forgiveness, that means you're guilty of something. But the Bible also uses the word justify. And the term justify is one that I think demands our real appreciation for what God is and what God does for us. What does it mean to justify? Really, to justify means to declare somebody not guilty. To declare a person innocent. We commonly hear that in the uh, police world. A policeman gets involved in a situation and uh, fires his weapon and there's immediately a, uh, a discussion, a study of, of why he fired the weapon and hopefully the answer will come back. It was a justified shooting. Justified shooting means there was a legitimate purpose for his doing it. He's not guilty of wrongdoing. To be justified is to be declared innocent. 
to be declared not guilty. Now we talked last night about the fact that we do sin and the problems of sin. Now we're going to talk about what God has done in order that we could be declared as not guilty. The Roman letter is a marvelous treatise on the gospel of Christ and pictures the fact that we're saved by grace, not by our own merit, not by our works, and we're not saved by the works of law. But we're saved because God has made a provision for us that we can be pardoned and declared innocent. Look in chapter 3 of the Roman letter. And I'm going to drop down to a conclusion that we're going to be reaching tonight. And then we're going to go back and see the background for this in Paul's discussion. In Romans 3, start reading in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ unto all them that believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being, here's our word, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to show His righteousness because of the passing over of the sins done aforetime in the forbearance of God. For the showing, I say, of His righteousness at this present season, that He Himself might be just and the justifier of him that hath faith in Jesus. Paul used the term justify and justification and says that God has done something in order that we could be declared as innocent. What's the background for that? There's a familiar statement in here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That really is a part of the discussion that Paul has just made. Go back to chapter 1. After the introductory material in the first 15 verses, Paul states a thesis for the book of Romans. Here's the subject matter that's going to be covered in this book. He says in verse 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed a righteousness of God from faith unto faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. Paul's going to discuss the fact that the gospel of Christ is a gospel of grace that God has provided for all mankind, for the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Those of you who are familiar at all with Bible history know that when God made the promise to Abraham, He promised him that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But then God began the preparation to do that very thing. And that preparation involved taking Abraham's seed and developing out of it a family that 
we call Israel the Jewish family. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, and God developed that nation. Many people think that that was God's purpose in life was just to do that nation. No. God was preparing to bring the seed of Abraham into the world by whom everybody would be blessed, not just the Jews. But he used the Jews in a very special way as we're going to see as we read this letter today and study it. Because Paul says, the gospel was first to the Jews and also to the Greeks or the Gentiles. Jews had a real harsh feeling toward the Gentiles. The word Gentile simply means the nations. That's simply the foreigners. Those are those other people. We're the Jews. They're those other people. And they recognized that God had made a special covenant with Abraham. And it kept that covenant through Isaac and Jacob. And under the law of Moses, they were a special people unto God. And they developed a certain sense of pride that we're God's people. Nobody else can be. Truth of the matter is, Gentiles could have served God. But the problem was, most of the world, most of the Gentile world, turned away from God. Read on in Romans 1, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known of God is manifest in them. For God manifested it unto them. For the invisible things of him, since the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that have been made, even his everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse, because that knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks but became vain in their reasoning, and their senseless heart was darkened. You know who he's describing? He's describing the, the world other than Jewish people. He's describing the world in general that had no excuse for not knowing and obeying God because God was evident in the world. And they knew of it. Remember the psalm that says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. God's handiwork is a demonstration of the fact that He is, that He made us. We're not here by accident, and this world cannot be explained by some kind of scientific accident. But these people gave up the knowledge of God. Read on. Verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God for the likeness of an image of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They turned to idolatry and built images of all kinds of things and bowed down and worshipped those things and claimed those things were their gods. Verse 24 says, Wherefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to uncleanness, that their bodies should be dishonored among themselves, for that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Who's he describing? Unfortunately, he's describing the world in, at that time. 
that had turned its back on God and turned to other gods, to the false gods. Go to ancient, go and look at the history of ancient Greece and Rome and the multiplicity of gods that they worshipped and the variety of ways that they tried to, to worship the gods that they had made for themselves. Paul describes it that in that condition they turn to every kind of sin. As you read on in chapter 1, he describes the way that they, they practice all kinds of immorality. To begin with, he uses the point that they corrupted the nature of man and woman and turned to homosexuality. That's not a new issue. We see it as relatively new in our world and increasingly a problem. But it was a common problem in Greece and Rome. And Paul starts out by saying they had corrupted the nature of man and woman and avoided entirely the concept that they're made in the image of God and should be treated as such. But those weren't the only sins. He goes on and gives a catalog of sins. I'll not read all of it. But he said they were filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malignity, whispers, backbiters, hateful to God, insolent, and the list goes on. But look at verse 32, where Paul says that, who knowing the ordinance of God, that they that practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but consent with them that practice them. They had forgotten God, they had left God out, and God let them degenerate into their own immoral Im immoralities, and the world was ultimately corrupt. Can't you imagine the Jewish people when they read Paul's statement about how bad the Gentiles were? Can't you imagine the Jews standing and say, oh boy, but look how good we are. Look how great we are. We're the people of God. We have the law of Moses. And we follow the law of Moses. We're the good guys. Drop down to verse 17 in chapter 2. Where Paul says, If you bear the name of a Jew and rest upon the law, you've got your confidence in the law of Moses. Now God gave the law of Moses. But they had their confidence in the, in the law. And they gloried in God. And knowest His will. And you approve the things that are excellent. Being instructed out of the law. And are confident that thou art thyself a guide of the blind. And a light to them that are in darkness. A corrector of the foolish. And a teacher of babes having in the law the form of knowledge and of the truth. Stop right there a minute. Paul says, oh yeah, you, you, you say you have the law, and you, you follow the law, and you look at everybody else and you condemn them, but look at verse 21. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest that a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou rob temples? Thou who gloriest in the law, through thy transgression of the law, dishonorest thou God? You know what Paul is doing? He says, yes, you had the law of Moses and you pay lip service to the law. You say, oh, we followed the law. Yes, we believe the law. 
And we condemn other people who are not doing so. But he said the fact of the matter is you violate the law yourself. As a matter of fact, man cannot, uh, does not live above law. And all of us have the weaknesses of the flesh and fall short of the glory of God. So turn over to chapter 3. And picking up the thought in verse 9 in chapter 3, Paul says, What then? Are we, Paul's a Jew, and he's talking to the Jews, are we better than they, the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we before laid to the charge of Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They have all turned aside, and they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not so much as one. What kind of picture was Paul drawing? He said it back in chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to both the Jews and the Greeks. And then he described the need of both of those groups. He showed that the Greeks, the Gentile world, had turned away from God, gone to their idols, worshipped in their own ways, and were corrupt. But he looked at the Jews and said, you have the law. You know what's right and wrong. You have the law that God gave at Mount Sinai, but you don't keep it. And you all fall short of perfection and then he quotes from the Old Testament writers and says there is none that is righteous now what that's picturing is this all of us sin even those who have the law even those who know the teaching of God fall short of keeping the law. Now Paul's going to present a problem. How can you be righteous before God? You've got the law, but you fail to keep it perfectly. <laughs> you know, if you kept the law of Moses perfectly, at back at that time, if you had kept the law of Moses perfectly, you wouldn't be a sinner. If you never violate the law, then you're not a sinner. If you're not a sinner, you'd not be lost. If you're not lost, you wouldn't have a need for anything. But like we emphasized last night, we need to face the reality that not just the nation that we live in today, but all mankind from the time of the beginning, have fallen short of the perfection of God. Now the Jews had the law and knew God's ordinance, but they didn't keep it perfectly. The Gentiles, on the other hand, had tried to make their own laws. They had built their own system of worship to God. And that fell short. Now, what was the plight of man that Paul's picturing? What he's picturing is all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, stood guilty of violation of God and stood in need of redemption, in need of forgiveness, how then could 
God redeem us? What could God do to make the provisions for us? He'd given the Jews a strict law, gave a book, but they couldn't live up to it. And none of us could do either. The Gentiles demonstrated that you can't find God on your own. So how could the answer be given? Let me read again what we started with in chapter 3, starting with verse 21. But now, apart from law, a righteousness of God has been manifested. God is going to provide some way other than by law keeping. The Jews demonstrated that you can't keep a law so perfectly that you never said. Apart from law, a righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law, the law of Moses, and the prophets, they'd all predicted a time is coming that a new covenant would be given. And he explains what it was, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ unto all them that believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That verse is not a prediction that you will commit sin. It's not a prediction that your children will commit sin. It's a, a commentary on the fact that he had already described that both Jew and Gentile, all mankind, sin. All of us fall short of the glory of God. So he says, in, in view of the fact that all sin and fall short of the glory of God, how are they justified? Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. It's a long tongue-twisting word that really means God paid the price. We couldn't save ourselves. There was nothing that we could do. The Gentiles showed you can't build a tower of uh, Babel up to, uh, to the heavens and find God on your own. The Jews demonstrated that you can't keep the law so perfectly that you never do a sin and therefore you're saved by virtue of your own works and your own merit. Paul's answer is God made the provision that we could be justified only by putting our faith, our confidence, our trust in Jesus. What did it cost God to make that provision? In verse 26 he says, He showed His righteousness at the present time that He Himself might be just and the justifier of him that hath faith in Jesus. That God might be just. What was the curse of sin? In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Sin has always been connected with death. And because of the sins of that first couple, 
They were separated from the tree of life lest they should eat and live. And death came to all men. Now you're not a sinner because Adam sinned. But you feel the consequence of Adam's sin in that physical death has come to all mankind. But from that time on, in God's Word, there is a connection between sin and death. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4, the prophet said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin and death connected. Man sinned. All men sinned. And the curse for it is death. But God wanted to declare us not guilty. How could he do it? Paul says he had to be just. God's justice meant he had to deal with the problem of sin. And how did he deal with the problem of sin? Mankind who sins are under the curse of death. But God wanted to deliver us from that. But the price that had to be paid for it was death. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus Christ came. Or was it that John the Baptist, or how did he describe it? Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Lambs were commonly used in the sacrifices by the Jews. <clears throat> Jesus, Lamb of God, would be the sacrificial offering to pay the price for sins. So that my sin could be forgiven. So that your sins could be forgiven. And God could maintain justice. The justice of God demanded that a price be paid. He couldn't just ignore sin. He had made the rule. The soul that sinneth it shall die. <clears throat> to redeem man from the curse of sin, the price had to be paid. And the price that was paid was that Jesus Christ, his son, died on the cross. The death of Christ is not just something that we honor by wearing a little cross around our neck. Or having a cross on the cover of the Bible. But it is the price that had to be paid if God was going to pardon our sins. But people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb People who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who gain the forgiveness, the pardon of their sins. And are declared innocent before God. Ought to appreciate. That Jesus Christ died for me. You know there's a passage over in Galatians 2 that 
strikes me deeply. Where the Apostle Paul, a man who truly appreciated the pardon that God had given him, he was chief of sinners in his own words. And God had pardoned his sin. And listen to Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. So that it is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live in faith. Faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul was not an egotist saying, hey, I'm so important, Christ died for me. He was a humble man saying, it is ever before my eyes that Jesus Christ died that I could be pardoned. That's the reason Paul makes the statement that he would not glory, he would not feel good except in the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you appreciate the sacrifice that was made for your sins and mine? Do you appreciate the gift that God gave when He sent His own Son to pay the price so that we could be pardoned? Don't ever lose sight of the fact that by our sins we're separated from God and by His grace provision is made to bring us back into a relationship with Him. Paul's going to go on in the Roman letter and tell what these people did in order to gain the forgiveness of their sins. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, he says, As many of you have been baptized into Jesus Christ, have been baptized into his death, we're buried with him through baptism into death, raised to walk in newness of life. You contact the death of Christ. When you go through the very likeness of His death, burial, and resurrection in baptism, and then being raised from that dead to live a new life, a life dedicated to God, but always appreciate of the fact that God loved you enough and Jesus loved you enough to pay the price for sin. If you've never obeyed the gospel, why don't you do it tonight? If you're a Christian wanting and needing prayers of others in your behalf, why not tonight while we stand together and sing?